Media is an evolving machine. It's no secret. It is easier now to get news, information and entertainment simply on your phone. Like most parts of the world, East Africa is realizing its potential. Access to internet and affordable mobile devices have also accelerated East Africans' consumption of media online. People are connecting and sharing more and more of their lives, which has now led to income-generating opportunities, creating platforms on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, starting their own channels, podcasts, and driving new audiences. Everyone is competing for your attention. So it begs the question, what has the new way of consuming media information meant for media in East Africa? I spoke to veteran news editors, Joe Odindo and Wangedi Mwangi, who provided more context on how the shift in storytelling has occurred over time. Our storytelling has been changing, and I think will continue changing. The fight for the nation uh, for liberation was a big factor influencing storytelling eh, in the 60s. And if you look at the papers of that time, the stories about what the nationalist leaders said, what the trade union leaders said, you know, because these were the leaders of the agitation, are the ones that have prominence. Yeah. Um, then, of course, Uhuru came, and suddenly the media found that it had to find, get, uh, get a new agenda. Rather, it had to refocus, because the, what was selling, what was driving the journalism, okay, it was still hot, but definitely it was not as hot as it had been. Politics was shaping storytelling. If you had a story um, that was pretty dramatic and earth-shattering, but came with a lot of risks, again, because of um, the politics of the time, you partnered or teamed up with um, foreign journalists. Um, so what you do, for instance, you have a story that you know you need to write, but it comes with a lot of uh, risks. So you let somebody else break that story, uh, and then you pick it up once it's already published in a foreign newspaper. You pick it up and then share it with, uh, with your own readers in, in your own country. And it's served the purpose very well. People who were shaping the news in the newsrooms were a lot of expatriates. So here they are, rewriting content, making decisions about headlines for a population that they only partially understood because they were not part of it. And even though they were more liberal than the old oppressor colonial class, they still, you know, you have to live among people to understand their reading habits and what they would want. And you can see some of the headlines, something like, I think you saw something moving around on social media the other day, wanted one luo to, to tame crocodile, a crocodile that was harassing people in Nairobi Dam. But you see, that headline could only have been written by someone who is not part of the community. I wouldn't write a headline like wanted one luo. I would feel very awkward even putting luo on a headline for a national newspaper. I was explaining to people, this headline was obviously written by an expatriate sub-editor. So that was another factor that shaped the storytelling. When you look at the 70s, you begin to see features that are more about the lives of the African readers. Yeah. You begin to see the content actually being generated. You had to accept that even in those early days, part of the reason that the content was about the expatriate reading class it's because even the content was being bought and was being generated by expatriate writers. People only write about the things they know. Now, the thing about Uganda was the, 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 the change in broadcast. Uganda set the trend in this region with Capital FM. All the things that happened in Kenya and Tanzania were following what was happening in Uganda. Why? One, because of they had so many people who were coming back from uh, exile when Museveni took over. They came with fresh ideas, yeah? And the environment also was very open. So the kind of conversation, the environment was open to the kind of conversation we now hear in FM radio. When we say Capital FM is Kampala's fresh hit station. I joined the industry at a time when um, technology was very basic, yeah? You had to rely on teleprinters and telex machines 
typewriters that were changed to the desk because at some point I think the management thought that they would grow legs and disappear. Uh, and then of course um, you went into the field, you did your story, came back to the office and then you produced your story in six copies. One went to the main editor-in-chief, the other one to the assistant, the other one to the news editor, then one went to the chief, uh, chief sub-editor and so on and so forth. And then at the end of the day, once you're done or you are editing, very manual editing with a pen and paper, you know, red ink all over the place, somebody cancelling things that somebody else had written and overwriting on those and then it went to the typesetters who type set everything manually and then in the evening uh, there was a whole team of people who would then produce uh, stuff that was called bromides and then paste them manually on um, large sheets of paper and then we went downstairs later in the night to correct to proofread and you know it was a messy manual and tedious business a shift in storytelling methods has led to new channels of media distribution and a breakdown in business models hesborn gave us an insight into the media viability in east africa are media houses adopting new business models i think the east african media landscape uh, is struggling just like uh, the media all over the world, struggling on two fronts, economic challenges, and of course the digital disruption that underscores some of these economic challenges. Why? Because there is a shift in audience behavior. Most of the digital natives and the millennials have these consumption habits that have disrupted uh, the business models as it were. But I would say that there is no single media house or big media house in East Africa that has just one revenue model. A lot of them seem to be having different revenue streams and it appears that the journey is now moving towards generating more revenues that is not ad-based on the digital platform. Look at the situation in Kenya a lot of consumption happens, happens on the digital platform and uh, the preliminary findings from our data shows that uh, most media houses in Kenya have moved towards monetization of content on the digital platform, at least the big media houses. And what they have are subscription models. You look at what is happening at Nation Media Group, Standard Group, uh, View Sasa, at uh, Royal Media Services. And the numbers uh, in terms of subscriptions that we've seen uh, for Nation and Standard, quite encouraging. And that tells you that there's, there's a lot going on in terms of tapping on the digital revenue. Probably running away from the initial model that most media houses uh, had thought of, uh, attract numbers on the digital platform, leverage on advertising. It does appear that that doesn't seem to be, you know, bringing in as much revenue as they had expected. And the journey is towards, you know, producing premium content and asking the consumers to pay for it. Uh, in Uganda, I think there seems to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, a few challenges here and there, especially on reaping on the economic benefits of the internet. And this is occasioned by the social media tax. So that social media tax in itself has made it very difficult for most of the consumers who would otherwise be consuming media content on the digital platform to even access, uh, you know, that content. In Tanzania, it's still the same thing, that there is, there is, there is a move towards uh, revenue diversification, and a lot of media houses are actually diversifying their revenues. But then again, the legislative framework, in as far as, uh, you know, uh, production of content on the digital platform is a bit frustrating, uh, so to speak, for content producers. Examples of media outlets that are innovating how to tell new stories can be seen through Mobile Journalism Africa here in Kenya, The Bank News in Uganda, and Honor Stories in Tanzania. Mobile Journalism Africa is a startup in Kenya going beyond headlines to help people understand issues and stories that affect them. So how have they adapted to new storytelling methods and what made them rethink this way? What mobile journalism has come to add to 
the already existing ways of storytelling is the technology and just how fast the news um, are produced. Yeah. So uh, essentially, right now, um, aside from what you do with a traditional camera, so you record, then you go to the to the studio, for instance, um, download the footage, start cutting. All that can now be done in the smartphone. So it's essentially a pocket studio. That's what we call it. We refer to it as um, at Mobile Journals in Africa. So we can actually do everything um, on the go. So it saves a lot on time and, and you can produce content from whatever location. You do not need to go to a physical studio um, to do that. The Debunk Show is a fact-checking online program run by fact-checkers in Uganda's Media Challenge Initiative, where they verify news stories and headlines separating fact from fiction. We are innovating around automating the fact-checking process with the Debunk, but we get to debunk misinformation in real time. All you need to do is to add the debunk bot number on your phone and then you get to share with the fact checker the misinformation and you debunk it in real time. Honor Stories is a media startup in Tanzania that uses digital storytelling to reclaim the dominant narratives surrounding our continent. Think of ourselves as a playground for the future of media. Uh, we, we are not just adapting to the changing uh, storytelling methods, but we're actually ushering them in. Uh, as pioneers for augmented reality, virtual reality uh, in storytelling here in Tanzania, and uh, with even technologies like artificial intelligence, all the different types of new tools, new technologies, new formats for storytelling, we try and usher them into this market, into Tanzania. So we're prepared by, uh, for the future by being the ones who are creating that future. I also spoke to Isaac Swiller, a news editor at the Royal Media Services radio desk, about how these new ways of media consumption has meant for legacy media like them. Basically, we've been trying to tap onto that audience, that niche market. And that's why you'll see if you go on that channel to consume news, there's what we call the SMS news alerts. When we break stories, basically we're going to share it there. And this actually also contributes to audience building. So we have, yes, fully fledged social media pages, this Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, where our audiences can uh, interact with our content. Uh, right now, you don't really need to sit before a TV set to watch the 9 p.m. bulletin or tune to radio. We have Radio Citizen app where the comfort of your phone, you can plug in and follow all our bulletins and all our programs. While the evolution of news, media, and storytelling has abounded, it has given rise to a new problem, fake news, the problem of our time. To elaborate more on this, I spoke to Makenia Juma, senior researcher at Africa Check, a fact-checking organization that verifies the authenticity of news reports and headlines. Africa Check, we have a guide for journalists. We have it in our website. We help journalists know what to do when they get a breaking news that they can't really verify. We can also help them verify the information before it goes out. So it's easier for you to, as a journalist to get uh, an accurate information out rather than just getting rumors out. When you're looking at information, let's say you've gotten something, uh, you just see breaking news from uh, international sources. Let's say it's a website talking about 100 people have died because they've taken COVID vaccine. This time now, Looking at that story, what we encourage people to do is pause and think about it, and then do the smell test. proponent for investing in innovation in media is the Media Innovation Center here in Kenya. So why is investing in media innovation so important? And how is the Media Innovation Center supporting new storytelling innovations? 
what the Media Innovation Center is doing um, is actually quite unique. Uh, we are the second media innovation um, hub in Africa, um, after Jamlab in South Africa, and first in East Africa, first in Kenya. So what we do, um, we support journalism, entrepreneurs, and storytellers um, through, first of all, our Innovators in Residence program, where we invite them to you know, submit their best ideas, after which we support them through coaching, mentorship, um, training, and a startup grant of up to $20,000. So we just guide them on the budgeting and the work plans um, and how they're going to spend the $20,000. But more importantly, how we support journalism entrepreneurs in East Africa is through building that innovation ecosystem and building that community of innovators. This year, the Media Innovation Center is currently incubating three innovating media startups in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. So how has the Media Incubation Program supported these three innovation startups and enhanced their storytelling methods? The Media Incubation Program has really supported our storytelling methods because First of all, it provided us with an infrastructure. We're in an office, we're able to work virtually. Um, we have wonderful people surrounding us. Um, we have budget to purchase some of the equipment and get some of the support we need. So on a pure structural level, we've been able to advance our project. And more so, we've also received some great mentorship and training from experts around the world who helped us develop our idea beyond kind of like the raw concept into something that has the potential for commercial success. I guess maybe just to add on to that, it's in, in terms of the trainings and having the support, I think we underestimate, or I underestimated the effect on our thinking and our capacity to, to vision bigger when you are in a safe environment. Um, and when you feel like you're supported um, through the trainings, the trainings have been really useful in getting us to think um, through our product from a different lens, from an entrepreneurial lens, whereas we are creatives. We created this company so that we could continue to tell stories. And um, now we're being supported in the journey of figuring out how to make a company um, work to create the infrastructure for, for us to keep telling those stories. And the, the funding and the infrastructure and the expertise have been um, really useful in that sense. The very fundamental thing I would say the program has done for us so far is we've had to build systems, right? And a system is anything from an email signature to a financial output manual to a social media policy to an interview guideline to an ethical reporting guideline. All of these things we've been able to build in the or design in the year that we've been in the like innovation program. So at the most rudimentary level, what the, what the program has done for us is help us design systems, which is very crucial because when you're a media company or you're a journalist, you're sort of focused on telling the story and not on the systems that make the story possible, right? But if a company, whenever two people are together, there has to be system, there has to be a financial workflow, there has to be a procurement workflow, there has to be a website, there has to be a social media page, there has to be all of these things that keep you know us integral. So I think primarily the program has been very helpful with helping us de de design systems, but also we've been able to, you know, meet like a cohort of incredible people. You know, there's the team in Kenya, the Lamb Sisterhood, there's honest stories, we've been able to feed into each other's uh, initiatives, see how they can collaborate. I've learned so much just like watching them innovate around the problems that they are individually solving. And I think that's been crucial. We've had mentorship. Um, we have an incredible mentor, Michael Nitegeka, who has been coaching us for the last six, seven, eight months and who has been very helpful. Like Michael has listened to us, rant about some of our problems. He's been patient. He's, you know, he's really listened to us. And when you're like a media founder or a media company, people sort of like assume that you know what you're doing many of the time. But then it helps that we are able to have a space in which we're able to be like our best or our, our worst selves or the selves, where we don't have to like perform progress or pe or perform knowledge that we don't have. And I think that's what AKU has been for us. We've been able to show up like a Slia and then get the help that we need. So media incubators like the one that we're currently part of as Honor Stories, uh, which is the Aga Khan Foundation's Media Innovation Program, um, has allowed us to do two things. And they're very important in the ecosystem because of these two things. One is the training. Um, there's a lot, there are a lot of gaps in trying to figure out or trying to transition journalists or storytellers into um, different forms and different formats of storytelling. Um, as I said before, the 
formats have changed it's gone into digital and even in this digital format in this digital platform rather there are several different formats that are, that are coming out every day you know once somebody has gotten into facebook suddenly there's instagram and after instagram suddenly there's tiktok um suddenly there's whatsapp as well and so how do you uh, create um, um, personnel and capacity build um, so that they are able to adapt to these different formats and these uh, different platforms that are coming out Apart, apart from that as well is making sure that also the training comes and is uh, essentially centered around human-centered design. Uh, uh, thinking of audience first and then working your way uh, backwards from that to create um, the content and to create the platforms that fill the gaps um, that the audiences need. A second part of that that makes incubators very important uh, is the funding. Um, because all of this uh, needs time, it needs personnel, and um, it needs to be secure that somebody can take a whole year out of their schedule to figure out whether this uh, idea that they have actually works. And then second, is it viable? Can, does it make business sense? And so incubators like the program that we have with the Khan Foundation is very, very important. A prerequisite for survival is understanding your audience and building a community a network of diverse media enthusiasts learning, sharing, and contributing to the community with peers and educators has proven to be instrumental in shifting perspectives in storytelling. A good example can be seen at the Media Innovation Center in Nairobi, the Media Challenge Initiative in Uganda, and the Innovate Hub in Tanzania. So what is the importance of audience development and new skills for journalists, content creators, and media owners? And why is it important to harness cooperation beyond borders? Grow that audience uh, and then retain. And that means it's beyond just posting things online. It's also coming up with quality content that keeps people glued and um, people can refer you to others and you find that you've created a machine that is out there and people keep just referring your content and I think that's one of the things that uh, uh, content creators have to keep in mind. Create content that other people can refer um, to others so that you even have your own clients are able to create an audience for you. Uh, right now we are living in, in as a cliche, right now we are living in a, in, a, in a global village. So we are always connecting with people across borders. So in a digital world, it's important for us or for innovators to work with others in different countries because you are able to partner on different projects. Um, you are able to know what's happening in other countries that in your country you may not be able to understand but also it's important for you for your content or your work to cross borders so that you can tap into other markets grow your audience and you never know um, when people in other countries are able to refer to your work as well uh, it means you are you are developing and people begin to trust what you're doing today we see the possibilities of what technology can do virtual reality, augmented reality, and these glasses, Snapchat glasses, that record my very own point of view. Facebook just launched its own Facebook glasses, reinventing how we tell stories. With all this in mind, we ask ourselves then, what does the future of journalism and media look like in East Africa? And what skills can we as journalists and content creators start learning to prepare us for the future?